All right, welcome to our Digitech Systems Paper Vision Enterprise Spotlight Training today. This is Nathan Schwinke. I'm uh, the Director of Technical Support for Digitech Systems. We got a great little training today for everybody. Uh, this will take take roughly between two to three hours, depending on how many questions we have throughout the uh, program. Um, Wendy Hamilton uh, is one of our technical support engineers and trainers. She'll be leading the training today uh, for you folks. Uh, we have a couple panelists online too as well that will be helping with uh, Q&A throughout the, uh, the training. John Shipman is our technical su support supervisor. And then we have Kyle Marks, who is our department SME. And those folks will be helping uh, with any questions that you folks have throughout the training. Um, we are just asking if you have questions to go ahead and put it in the chat box and those will be reviewed and answered real time if they can be. Uh, if they cannot be answered real time, we will get back to you after the session is over uh, with answers to your questions. Uh, so depending on the complexity of the question, um, uh, most of them should be able to be answered during the session today. Uh, again, the session will take two to three hours and uh, we hope you have a great time today and I uh, uh, hope everyone has fun. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Wendy Hamilton and she'll get started with the process. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everyone. Um, like Nate said, my name is Wendy Hamilton and I'll be going through the material today with everyone. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who wishes we could all be at some exotic location for this type of training, but we're glad everyone can tune in today uh, to go into some new features and functionalities of Paper Vision Enterprise. We're going to be covering um, some new features of uh, Release 87. And like Nathan said, if anyone has any questions, I'm going to be going through um, specific sections. And if after a section you have a quick question you want to throw in the chat box, feel free. Um, John Shipman and Kyle Marks are both going to be keeping an eye out for that. So definitely don't hesitate if you have questions. If it's something pretty specific that you want us to go back to and kind of show again, we won't be able to uh, do that during the training, but um, definitely put in those questions. And then at the very end, um, we'll go through some additional questions and answer them as they come. So again, feel free to use that chat box. And we are going to go ahead and get started. Here is just an overview of what we're going to cover today, um, starting with some new user account types that have been added. And like I said, this is for release 87 and higher. Multi-factor authentication is also something we'll cover and actually show you how to get set up for users. We'll talk about to token authentication and what portions of the software it abides for. Next is solution profiles. We'll go over the creation and the re um, restoration of solution profiles and how uh, those might work really well for your environment, depending on how you'd like to use them. We'll also discuss parent child index fields as it pertains to projects. We'll point out some improved logging options that were added. And we'll go over the mobile application. To get started, we're just gonna dive right into the new user account types. And here are the available uh, user account types for Paper Vision Enterprise. Um, a lot of these are gonna look very familiar. Most of you, of course, have been using these uh, for a while now and know exactly what they do. I'm just gonna give a super brief description of each so we're all on the same page. Global administrators, of course, uh, these users control every aspect of configuration for Paper Vision Enterprise, including configurations for all entities. Um, global administrators cannot log into the Paper Vision Enterprise site and actually search for documents. Um, system administrators can administrate a single entity and have access to all functionality in all projects for that specific entity. Um, they can, of course, log in and view documents. The next one is one of the new ones, and you can tell by the asterisks on the end. This is a limited system administrator, and I'm gonna go into detail on that. We're actually gonna set one up, kind of demonstrate what they can and can't do. E-form and workflow administrators, those are both the same. They can configure and create e-forms, configure and create workflow. 
definitions. The next new one is project administrators. And we'll go over that in detail as well. And then you have your basic system users as well. And these users can log into the website, search and handle documents depending on the security access that you give them per project. The first one we're gonna talk more in detail about is the limited system administrator. So these are created, of course, using the administration console. You can, we're going to actually create one of these, so I will demonstrate that, but in the screenshots below, you can see um, right clicking, you have the option to add a new user as you always have, but you also now have the option to add a new limited system administrator. By choosing that, you're adding a user that can perform administrative entity tasks, but they can't perform any project or document tasks. For example, viewing or searching for documents on the website. They can log into the website. On the right hand side, you'll see a screenshot of what it would look like for a limited uh, administrator to log into the website. They just have one button for the web administration console. Project administrators have full access only to specific projects and can administer all project level functionality. Um, these types of tasks include things like editing the project properties, editing those recycle bin settings, um, doing project level migrations. They can also set up things like directory manager jobs, document associations, document security levels, and handle uh, adding or removing security access for users and groups. So project administrators, um, they can log into the website and they can view documents depending on the security access that they have. They cannot create uh, new system groups or users, but they can add security access for uh, system groups and users that are already in existence and we'll go into that. We're gonna create a project admin as well and kind of demonstrate the functionality there. So I am going to switch over to my test environment here. And the first thing we're gonna do is log into an admin console. And for this, I'm just gonna log in as a global administrator. On the top left hand corner, I'm gonna expand entities. And right now for this environment, I just have one uh, entity to work with. As always, to add any type of users um, on the entity level, you would go down to general security, expand that, and select system users. Here, as you can see, I already have some test users to work with. Um, right now, they are all just main system users, uh, and I have two system administrators. First, we're gonna add a limited system administrator. So I'm gonna right click in the white space. Note, you can also just right click at system users on the left and select new limited system administrator. Here, we're just gonna give this user the name of limited user. I'm gonna uncheck the user must change password at next login, so it makes us e it easy for us, and I'm gonna leave the password blank. You'll notice under administration rights, it is all grayed out since limited system administrators um, have their rights already assigned to them, and there's nothing you can edit or configure here. So we're gonna go ahead and click okay. Say yes at that prompt for the blank password. And now we have that limited user as the username, it lets us know under the type column that it is a limited system admin. All right, so first things first, we are going to log into the admin console as that user. Um, just to compare and contrast, as you know, right now I'm logged in as a global admin. Top left-hand corner, I have access to global administration as well as entity administration. I'm gonna close out and log back in as that limited user. I'm going to switch to login as entity administrator, put in my username. Okay. 
and you'll see in the top left, no global administration uh, options are listed, but I do have that entity um, listed here. If I expand it, I have all of the functionality here as you would usually see for any type of system administrator or global administrator. So under here, I have my general security. I can create uh, or edit any type of system groups users. I can edit that security policy, set up encryption keys. I can view any data groups. I can import or delete those data groups. And I have full reign over the projects as well. This includes security access, setting up directory manager jobs, uh, enhanced auditing, turning that on or off, and records retention and destruction. And at the very bottom, you'll notice that I have the normal reports section here, and I can view those reports as well. So in this instance, it is a lot at like logging in as a system administrator. I have all the same functionality when it comes to the admin console. Now we are going to switch a little bit and log into the website with that new user. Here I just have my Paper Version Enterprise website. I'm going to log in as my limited user with no password. It's going to think for a second and load. And this will look a little different than you're normally seeing. Usually you would have your projects on the left, recent documents. Uh, if you had eForms or workflow, you would have those boxes as well. However, here we only have the administration box uh, listed here for us. And this is essentially the same as going to your user dropdown and selecting administration. So we're going to go ahead and pull this up. Here is the web administration console, and on the left-hand side, you'll notice I have those same type of functionality that you would see in the uh, SIC administration console. I can edit users from here, go to project properties, view my data groups and data storage, and see reports. So again, just to kind of recap for the limited system admin, you have all the functionality when it comes to administration. However, you do not have any type of access to documents, so you cannot log in, view documents, you can't add annotations, you can't export documents from the viewer, um, but you do have that administrative task option. So that is a bit of the limited system administrator. So now we're gonna move on and talk more about a pro the project administrator option. So I'm gonna close out of here. I'm going to go ahead and log out. And we are going to create a project administrator. Right now, as you can see, I've got a few test projects here and I can view them all logged in right now as a limited system admin. I'm going to go to system users under general security. And here I'm going to add a new user. This time, instead of choosing new limited system administrator, I'm just going to click on new user. And this should be a very familiar window. I'm just going to put in project user. I'm going to uncheck user must change password and next login. And at the bottom, you'll notice you have the normal administrative administration rights options. However, the last one is new, and that is project administrator. So I do want to make this a project administrator. I'm going to go ahead and check it. And then I'm going to select select projects button. Here you will see a list of all of the projects for this entity. For me, I want to add uh, accounts payable workflow and HR employment applications for this specific project administrator. So essentially you can see here how you can have multiple project administrators. Um, you can even have a single project administrator per project or they can administer they can have administrative rights to multiple projects. I'm going to click OK with that. It lets me know that I have two projects selected and I'm going to click OK. In the system users list, you'll notice that our project user under type has the project admin type there. So 
the easy way to tell the difference between the two. Now I'm going to go ahead and log out of the admin console and log back in as that new project administrator. Here, you'll notice in the top left-hand corner, I do have my entity listed there. However, if you expand, you'll notice that your administrative tasks are um, very limited compared to the normal system administrator. So we do have general security. If I expand it, you'll notice I do not have the ability to change the security policy for the entity. I can't create encryption keys. I cannot um, add new users. However, I do have access to system groups that are already part of the projects that I have administrative rights to. So you might look here and wonder um, why I only have certain system groups here and not the users. These groups are being used in the projects that I have access to. So under projects, you'll notice that I have that accounts payable workflow project and I have that HR employment application project. If I expand these, I do have full administrative rights to both of these projects. I can create directory manager jobs. We could change security access, add records retention policies, anything like that. I can also select the project, right click, and select properties, and I can edit those as well. Now, when it comes to security access, if I select security access and I wanna add some, you'll notice that uh, though I don't have access to the system users themselves, I can add security access for any system user already created for the entity. So we're gonna click on new security access and it automatically populates all of the users and groups that are available. So here, even though I cannot make any changes to the user, Bob, Chris, or Cindy, I could add them to the project, give them full rights, and it would be added there. You can also take uh, rights away by just deleting any type of users or groups listed in security access. All right, we're gonna go ahead and log into the website using our project administrator so you can see the differences there as well. So I'm gonna close out of the admin console and open back up my browser. Here, I'm just gonna log in with that project user. Here you'll notice in the top left hand corner, you have your normal windows, right? You have your projects, your e-forms, destruction lists on the right, you've got any type of recent documents or favorite projects in e-forms. And you might be asking yourself, well, um, we have access to two projects, why are they not listed here? So by default, when you are a project administrator, you have all the administrative rights to those projects. However, unless you have security access specified for your user, you cannot log in and view the documents or anything like that. You can give that access to that project administrator, however, and that's what we're gonna do here. So in the top right-hand corner, I'm gonna use that user dropdown, and we are going to go to the web administration console by selecting administration. Here you'll see that our options on the left are the same as the administration console. We have our entity. We can edit the general security for the system groups that are already part of the two projects. And we have our two projects listed. So let's say we wanted this project administrator to not only have administrative rights, but also to view and edit documents we would go to security access. We would add it in the top left-hand corner. 
we would go ahead and select our project user, go to rights. I'm going to go ahead and select all, but as you can see, you can give as many rights or as little rights to this project administrator. However, just remember that as a project administrator, this user can come into security access and edit anything in this window. So giving this user uh, only certain rights uh, doesn't really, of course, seem like it would do much since they could technically come in here and select all at any point at any time. So we're just going to select all right off the bat, click save here, say OK at the prompt. We are sure we want to add this user and now it is added. So we're going to test that out. I'm going to go back to my browser. I'm going to log out and back in just to make sure my changes have uh, taken effect here. And you'll notice that I now have the option to view my accounts payable workflow project. I'm going to go ahead and select it. And just do a blank search to make sure that I have any type of search results for the documents in this project. All right. And I can see all the documents. I have one of 90 at the bottom right hand corner. And if I wanted to, I can open up a document, just like any other system user or system administrator would. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close that and log out as my project user. The next thing we're going to do is log back in as the admin console. This time I'm just going to log in as a global administrator. And we are going to add a document security level for that project. So accounts payable workflow, this is the one that we gave security access to for that project user. We are going to go to document security levels, add a new one. And this is just going to essentially be a lockdown document security level. And I'm going to add all users to it. So now I'm going to apply. And what this essentially is doing for those that might have not used document security levels much quite yet, um, this is um, adding a lockdown of all documents. So until I give access with additional document security levels to users, they cannot view any of the documents in this project. However, uh, system administrators, of course, if you uh, know that they can view documents regardless of document security levels, but let's see if the project administrator can as well. We're just going to log in as the project user. I'm going to open up the project and just do a blank search just like we did before. And you'll notice that no records are available. So it is very important uh, to know that just being a project administrator, um, you do have the same type of limitations as a system user when it comes to security access. So if you do want your project administrator to be able to view all documents at all times, just be very aware if you have any type of document security levels that they are added um, the extra access there so that it does not apply to them. I'm going to go ahead and log out. And I'm going to go ahead and remove this document security level for the rest of the training. Now, if I would log in as my project user, I would be able to see all those documents. So the main things to kind of take away about the project administrators is they have those administrative abilities. However, when it comes to security access, you do have to specify um, in order for them to be able to log in and view documents. All right.
And we're just going to move on to our next subject, which will be multi-factor authentication. And again, if anyone has questions throughout, just remember um, if you weren't here at the very beginning of the training, we do have that chat box option. Uh, we have Kyle Marks and John Chipman who are keeping an eye out on that. Uh, so if you wanted to ask some questions, feel free to throw them in that chat box. All right, so this is just a brief overview of multi-factor authentication. We are actually gonna set this up um, and through the demonstration as well for a user or two. Uh, Multi-factor authentication is an authentication method that requires the user to provide two or more verification factors to gain access to a resource. Uh, just a little brief description for those who might not have used MFA or multi-factor authentication previously. When it comes to PaperVision Enterprise, um, it supports the following applications. In the demonstration we're gonna do, I will be using Google Authenticator on my mobile device, but you are more than welcome to use any of the four listed here and it'll work just fine. To uh, enable multi-factor authentication, you would go into the admin console security policy and the authentication tab and we'll go through that when we're setting it up but um, if you are there at the moment and I'll show you on the next slide you'll notice that their MFA can be optional or required per entity so if you wanted it to be an option for users but you didn't want every user to have to abide by logging in with an MFA code each time you would set it to just be optional However, if you did want everyone to be forced to use MFA when logging in each time, you can set it to required. MFA can be enabled for all users, so not only your system users and your project or limited system admins, you can also do it for global administrator accounts. MFA is managed at the entity level uh, by a global or entity administrator. Except, of course, if you're doing MFA for a global admin, um, it, of course, isn't managed at the entity level. That would just be managed by global admin accounts. Here is a little preview of how to set that up. The screenshot you're seeing now is that security policy for a specific entity. If you look a little towards the bottom of the screenshot, you'll see there is a multi-factor authentication section with two options, the first being enable multi-factor authentication and the second being to require it. Just note by default, neither one of these are checked um, when you install PaperVision Enterprise uh, release 87 or higher. However, if you wanted to enable it, you would have to go into your security policy and check that enable button. Right after you enable it, it will be an option for users uh, when they're logging into the website. And then they can set it up there. And of course, if you want it required for your entity, you can check that required button. And this uh, require multi-factor authentication is entity specific. It does not pertain to global admins. Users can set up MFA uh, via the user options drop down or user drop down, then selecting user options in the website. You'll notice that uh, for release 87 and above, there is a multi factor authentication tab that was added. And that is where you can go through the steps to set it up. If, if, if MFA is required, a user will be prompted to set up their multi-factor authentication at their very next login. So let's say you did decide uh, you wanted it to be required, right when you select that require checkbox in your security policy, the next time anyone logs in, if they haven't already set it up for themselves, they will be prompted to and will not be able to log in until they do. Here is a look of those step-by-step -step instructions that you'll be met with when setting up MFA. Step one is laid out for you. It just says to download and install one of these four applications on your phone or tablet. 
Step two will be to scan the barcode that shows up on your screen. So if your device has a camera, you can just hold the camera up, make sure that box is within the camera range, and it will automatically uh, submit that and process it. However, let's say you're using a device where your camera is not, one, not functioning, or you just don't have a camera on the device, you can use a manual entry, and you can see that uh, key, the very, very long list of numbers and letters, and you can input that instead. Once you do that, your application will then generate a six-digit verification code to use. Step three is just you entering your password and that verification code as it is on your mobile device. And for Google Authenticator, and I assume the other apps as well, these uh, MFA codes, the six digit verification codes, they do refresh. Um, I know for Google Authenticator, it's every 60 seconds. So as long as you put in the verification code and click verify code and activate before that code dis uh, expires, it will then show a success message and you'll be able to turn it off at any time if you want as long as it's not required in the entity. And we're gonna go through this step-by-step uh, step and set it up for a user as well. MFA settings can be reset via the admin console under general security system users. So here's a little screenshot where you right-click on a user. You do have a reset multi-factor authentication button. So for example, let's say an individual set their account up, they have their MFA application on their device and they lose their phone or it's damaged and they can no longer have access to that application that they set it up on. Um, they of course cannot log in to their account to turn it off, but any type of administrator account that has access to users and groups can right click their user and select reset multi-factor authentication. This will give them the option to, if it's required for the entity, it will at least give them the option to set it back up on a different device or set it up later uh, whenever they want if it's just enabled and not required. This is the same for global administrator accounts as well. All right, we're gonna go ahead and set up multi-factor authentication for a new user. So we're gonna go to the admin console. We're already logged in as a global administrator. Again, you can do this as a system administrator as well, or as a limited system administrator. We are going to expand general security under our entity and go to security policy. I'm gonna double click on configure security policy to bring up the window. And you'll notice now there is an authentication tab. And at the very, towards the bottom, there is multi-factor authentication section. Like I said, um, by default, this is not enabled. So this is something that you would have to go in and, and check before it can be used by your users. So we're gonna go ahead and enable it. I'm not gonna require it at this time. And I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. Next, we are going to go to system users. I'm going to create a new user for this, and it's just going to be called MFA user. As always, I'm going to uncheck that user must change password at next login and leave the password blank just for demonstration purposes and click OK. Now let's pull up the website and log in as our new MFA user. Before I log in, I do want to point out, you will notice that use multi-factor authentication link right above the login button. This will always be there now, um, as long as you're using release 87 or higher. If you select it, you'll notice there is a place to put in your MFA code if you have multi-factor authentication already configured for your user. For now, I don't have it configured yet, so I am just going to log in as I normally would. In the top right hand corner, I'm going to use my user drop down and go to user options.
on the left hand side, you'll notice that I have my normal tabs of general and signatures, but I also have a multi-factor authentication option. I'm going to go ahead and click that. And here, just like that screenshot that we already went over, it gives me step-by-step -step instructions. So if your end users are kind of not really sure how to set it up, this is really helpful. Uh, they could just go through the step-by-step -step instructions and do it on their own. First, of course, it's telling me to download and install the Google Authenticator app, which I already have on my mobile device. And then it's asking me to scan the barcode. So I'm not able to show you this on my mobile device, unfortunately, but I am scanning the code right now. As long as that box is within the view of my camera, it automatically creates that account under my Google Authenticator app. Now that it processed, it is flashing a six digit verification code at me and it is showing me that I have 60 seconds before it refreshes. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in. For me, that is 712737. You don't need to hit enter or anything like that. Once you input it in, if it is correct, it will configure itself and let you know that it has configured successfully. You'll also notice that you now have a toggle that is on or off depending on what you would like. So anytime I can log in, turn this off and not have to put in an MFA code to log in. We're gonna test this out by logging out and logging back in. I'm gonna go ahead and try to just log in without my MFA code so you can see what that message will be. The system could not log you on the provided MFA code is invalid. So that is the message that you'll see if MFA has been configured for a user and they're not putting in a code or maybe not the correct code. Note that this goes whether or not um, you have MFA required. So right now we don't have it required. However, once a user sets up MFA for themselves, it is required for them until they turn it off or until an administrator turns it off for them by resetting it in the admin console. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in an MFA code that I have on my device at the moment. As you can see, it's refreshed and I have a new code. And it logged me in successfully. At any time, just to reiterate, I can go to my user options, go to the MFA tab on the left and turn it off. For now, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it on and close out of the website. And we are gonna to try to log into the Paper Vision Thick client and show you how it looks there as well. I'm gonna go ahead and log out. I was logged into the client as admin before. And here, I'm just gonna change my username to MFA user. And you'll see I have this use multi-factor authentication option. I'm just gonna hit login without putting in any type of code. And you should get the same error message at the top as you do on the website. So I'll put in the code that I have at the moment. And it logged me in successfully. I'm gonna go ahead and log out. And that's how it works for the thick client and also the website. We are also going to try it out with Paper Vision tools. So I know not everyone uh, uses Paper Vision tools, but if you did and were kind of curious how this worked with that, I'm just gonna open up Word, Microsoft Word open up a blank document so I can get to that add-ins tab at the top. And I'm gonna pull up the options. Here I'm gonna update my server URL to reflect the machine I'm on. And at the very bottom, you'll notice that it says um, 
caching of login credentials. Mine just says always ask for my username and password. I'm just going to leave it at that for this and I'm going to click save. Now in the top left hand corner, I'm going to try to log in. And of course, this is what you would be doing if you were trying to upload a document to Favorision Enterprise from Word itself. Once I do this, I'm going to try to log in using my UF MFA user without multi-factor authentication code. And it gives me that little pop-up with the same message as the other two locations. It cannot log me in. I need to provide that MFA code. No problem. I'm just gonna wait for my code to refresh real, real quick. It's giving me a new one, so I'm just gonna pop it in there, click login, and in the top left-hand corner, sorry, I might not hit the right button one moment. And it would log me in and I would be able to um, upload my Word document to my uh, Paper Vision Enterprise uh, entity. And it doesn't seem like it likes that. So I'm going to try this again uh, with a different user. So here, I'm just going to pull up Excel. Like I said, my Word didn't seem to be super happy with that. And do the same thing. If you'll notice, Excel and Word both have that add-ins tab at the top with your options there. My uh, URL is listed there. I'm going to click OK. I'm actually going to test my connection here. And log in. put in my username, no password, and the MFA code. All right. And again, um, sorry guys, it looks like my uh, office on my machine is not very excited to work with my Paper Vision Enterprise instance, but hopefully everyone can see how you would go about doing MFA with Paper Vision tools as well. Next, we are going to set up MFA for a global administrator account. So same type of situation, top left hand corner, you'll be selecting global administrators. And here, if you have multiple global administrators, you can uh, enable MFA for each and every one of them. I'm going to right click and you'll see the option to set up multi-factor authentication. It's a bit different when it comes to global administrators. Just remember they cannot log into the website, so they can't set it up in that method. Um, so there is that option to set up from the admin console. We're going to go ahead and click setup. Just make sure um, if, if you already have MFA set up for your global administrator, you would get this type of message. Are you sure you wish to replace your current multi-factor authentication configuration with a new one? We're just going to select yes. And it gives you the same type of step one, step two, step three, and you go through the exact same uh, same steps here. So just so you know, when using uh, any authenticator app, such as Google Authenticator, you can have multiple users use the same device. So I'm just going to use my same mobile device. I'm going to add a new uh, user here, scan the code or scan the barcode. And it gives giving me a verification code that's completely separate from my MFA user. So I'm going to put that in here. and verify code and activate. Now I'm gonna log off of the admin console and we're gonna see what happens when I try to log back in. So 
I'm just going to put in my username and password and click OK. And it gives me that little prompt. This account has MFA configured. You need to provide the MFA code. So you'll notice that there is a checkbox for MFA code. When it's not checked, you don't have the box listed at all. However, if you do have it checked, you have the option to put in your code here. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the code flashing on my screen. And it opens up the admin console for that user. So you can use it for global admins, and you can use it for uh, system administrators, just system users, uh, project administrators, and limited system administrators. For the rest of the demonstration, I'm just going to go ahead and reset my MFA so that we don't have to keep putting in that code each time. Um, but just know that if you have a global administrator account that you set up MFA for, um, the main way to reset it is to log in as a global administrator to reset it. Um, system administrators, you know, uh, limited system administrators, they cannot log in and reset a global administrator MFA configuration. So um, if you have multiple global administrators, you can log in as a different global administrator and come in here and reset it. Otherwise, you would have to log in as the uh, default global administrator if that's all you had listed to reset it. So just be mindful of that when you're setting it up. If you only have one global administrator, you know, be kind of careful when setting it up. Um, if anything happens to the device or you're not able to log in, um, it would be a lot more complicated. So we're going to go ahead and reset MFA for our global administrator and test it out. Make sure we can still log in without that MFA code. I'm going to uncheck MFA code and log in here. And I can log in just fine. I'm going to go ahead and reset it for MFA user as well. We're going to go back to our security policy and we're going to make it required so you guys can see how your users would deal with that the next time they log in. So I'm going to select require and I'm going to log in as just a test user I have. Right when they log in with our username and password, it's going to take them directly to this configuration window. They will be forced to configure this before they can access the Paper Vision Enterprise site. So just keep this in mind. Um, if you're making it required for your entity, make sure your users kind of understand uh, and know what's going on when they get to the screen and uh, make sure they follow step-by-step -step instructions and it should be configured successfully. So. I'm going to go back to my admin console and just turn that um, off of required for the rest of the demonstrations. All right, so that um, is what we're going to cover for MFA. Like always, make sure and throw any type of questions into that chat box if you have them. And just for um, anyone who's kind of curious and hasn't uh, seen the messages, uh, we are recording the session and it will be available on my DSI within the next week or so. So if you're wanting to see this functionality again, kind of go through it yourself and practice those projects too, um, you can do that as well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close out of the admin console and we're gonna continue on here. The next thing we're going to cover is token authentication. It is now possible to authenticate using tokens rather than using your username and password each time. Um, tokens allow users to authenticate to the following applications without being tied to a changing password or um, MFA. So um, this Essentially, you can close out of any of these applications, and then the next time you open it back up, it will just open to, um, for, such as the thick client, it'll just open and show your projects, 
instead of asking and prompting you for your username and password each time. This is even with MFA being enabled and required for an entity. So we're going to go through here. We're going to kind of show how it works with the thick client. And I'm also I'm going to touch on the other applications as well. In order to enable application tokens for your entity, you would go in, back into that security policy. You guys probably already noticed this as we were going through the MFA section. At the very bottom, you see your application tokens. You have enable application tokens. That is checked by default when you install PVE. So if you didn't want anyone to be able to use application tokens, you would want to come in here and uncheck that. Otherwise, it is uh, checked by default, just to make sure everyone remembers that. You also have the option to expire tokens after a certain amount of days. So you can separate that out by expiring unused tokens after a specific amount of days, and then also active tokens. So you can have those uh, different if you'd like. Unused tokens, of course, are tokens that have been sitting uh, and have not been used to log a person in after so many days. Active ones, uh, these will expire even if they were just used um, two seconds before the expiration date hit. So those are both options. Each user can view their own uh, user application tokens and see if they are active or not for their username by logging into the website, clicking that user dropdown, and then selecting application tokens. Here you'll notice in the screenshot below, you have your application tokens listed and you have the ability to revoke them. Of course, revoking an application token will cause the system to ask for your username and password the next time you try to log in to that application. We're going to go ahead and make sure an application tokens are enabled by logging into the admin console. I'm just going to log in as a global administrator. However, of course, you could check this using any type of system administrator, limited system administrator. Under entities, I'm going to go to that general security section and select my security policy. Here in the authentication tab at the very bottom, you'll see that application token section. And like I said before, by default, that enable application tokens is checked. So just to kind of um, review, I just wanted to make sure it was still checked. Here I can expire tokens after so many days. I'm just going to put in 30 days for unused and 60 days for active. We're of course not going to be uh, staying in this presentation for 30 days to see that take effect, um, but I'm sure uh, you guys can uh, un imagine what would happen after the 30 days. The user would just log in and have to put in their username and password. All right, so we are going to log in to the thick client, which is one of those applications that use application tokens. I'm just going to make this bigger so everyone can see. And the user we're going to use is just a test user I have. Username is just test, no password. And I'm going to click login. My test user has access to all the projects listed in the top left hand corner. Here you can open up projects, search for documents, do whatever you'd like to do. In the top right hand corner, notice that you do have that log out button. If you log out of an application, the token automatically revokes for that session. So we're not going to hit the log out, we're just going to hit the close button in the top right hand corner of the application. And now just to confirm an application token was created, we're going to log into the website as that test user. To view application tokens, you click your user dropdown in the top right hand corner. 
and select application tokens. Here is an example of the application token that you would see when using the thick client. It tells you what the application is, paper vision client, tells you the operating system and computer name. My computer name I'm on right now is called train. It also shows a created and last used date. I'm going to minimize this browser because we're going to come back to it. And we're going to test this out, make sure it works. We're going to open up the thick client one more time and see if it prompts us for our username and password. And as you can see, it didn't prompt us for that username and password. It just logged us in automatically using that token. And we can go about our business here, look up documents, add documents, and not have to worry about logging in each time. Now, I'm going to go ahead and log out this time instead of Xing out of the application itself. We're going to go back to the browser. I'm going to go to home, just give it a second to update and make sure it's refreshed. And then I'm going to go to application tokens. And you'll notice that that one got revoked automatically when I logged out of the sick client. I'm going to log in just one more time to create that application token and close out of the application instead of logging out. I'm going to go back to home to make sure this has an, op uh, an option to refresh and go back to application tokens and you'll notice it popped back up. This time I'm going to revoke from the website so I'm going to click the revoke button gives you that confirmation. Do you want to delete this application token? We're going to say yes. And let's try to go into the client one more time. And it asks for my username and password since that was revoked. Through the admin console, um, you can also revoke application tokens in the general security system users section. So in the top left hand corner, I'm going to go to my entity. Under entities, we would be going to general security, system users. I'm just going to right click on any system user and you'll notice that you now have the option to revoke application tokens per user. All right, and this can be used with the SIG client. Um, it can be used for the mobile application. It can also be used for um, paper vision tools. So you could log into Word on paper vision tools, close out of it without logging out, and then the next time you try to pull up Excel um, or a different Microsoft Office application, you wouldn't have to log back in. And application tokens are uh, Windows user specific as well. So if you log into your Windows machine as your username, you open up Paper Vision, log in as your Paper Vision user, that application token is stored. If you log out of your machine and someone else logs in under a different Windows user account, they wouldn't be able to open the client up to a session for your username because they are specific to the Windows user account. So you can share a computer between multiple people and use application tokens um, as long as you're logging out of the Windows user and logging in as somebody else. Um, each person can have their own application tokens and not have to worry about any type of security issues with that. Application tokens uh, still work as well if you log out or restart your machine. Um, as long as your application token hasn't expired or anything like that, 
you should be able to log right into the Fit client after a reboot and not have to put in your username and password. So the last thing we're going to do here is just um, set up uh, MFA for a user and make sure we can use application tokens even when MFA is set up. So first we're just going to go to our website. I'm going to log in as that MFA user. We do have to configure MFA again for this specific user. So we'll go to user options, MFA. And I'm going to enter that verification code. Right after it refreshes. <laughs> All right, MFA is turned on for this user again. Just to confirm, I'm going to log out, log back in real fast. Making me use my code. All right, so we're going to log in to the FIT client as that MFA user. We do have to put in that MFA code the first time since we don't have an application token already created. So I will put in that authentication code. And now, like I did before, I'm just gonna close out of the application. I'm not gonna click the log out button, but just the X in the top right hand corner. MFA is enabled and it is on for this user. And we're just going to try to get back into the thick client here. And we did not have to put in our password. We did not have to put in another MFA code. It automatically logged us in with the application token. So that'll be really nice for those who do have MFA on, but don't necessarily want to have to be putting in a code every uh, two minutes if they're getting in and out of an application such as the Fit Client or PV Tools. All right, I'm going to go ahead and reset uh, MFA for that user. And again, you can do that by um, logging into the account and turning that toggle to off or just resetting it from the admin console. All right, the next thing we're going to get into are index field relationships for projects. Paper Vision Enterprise now supports parent-child index field relationships. Um, this allows an administrator to specify relationships between index fields. Um, for example, you can now configure these so that upon uploading a document or altering index field values of an existing document, um, just when one field is selected, the available list of values for the child field is limited as defined. Um, this allows an admin to specify a relational order of the index fields. Administrators can configure separate enforcement settings for searching, adding documents, scanning documents, and altering index fields. They can manually add values uh, to each of these field types or um, add bulk uh, value, a, a big list of values by importing a, a list that way. So we're going to go over how to do this. We're actually going to set up a practice project and add our index fields ourselves. So here I am still logged in as a global administrator. I'm just going to leave it as that and we're going to create a new project. I'm going to go down in my entity and click on projects. I'm going to right click and select new and we're just going to call this parent slash child. For this, we are going to keep it super simple. We are only going to add three index fields, but just know, of course, you can get as 
complex and have as many index fields as you want and you can configure them that way. So for this, we are just gonna need an index field called state, another one for city, and the last one is just going to be zip. And for this, I'm just gonna change the field type to number and click okay. So here, as you can imagine, we are going to want to set up index field relationships to where we select a state, and then depending on the state, it populates a certain list of cities. And then, of course, depending on the city, it populates a certain amount of zip codes. In order to save these settings first, we have to click OK at the bottom, so we're going to go ahead and do that. And parent-child is now a part of our projects list. So I'm going to go ahead and expand projects and find our parent-child project. In order to define index field relationships, you will go to your project and right-click it and select define index field relationships. Here it asks you to show the field relationship order. So we are gonna click that add button to add our first field. We want the first field to be state, that's what they're gonna select first. So I'm gonna click that add button, select state. After that, we want them to select city. So we're gonna add that to the list. Then comes zip. Underneath that section, you have an enforcement section. So you can decide whether or not these field relationships are available to users through searching, adding slash scanning documents into the project, or when someone is altering index field values. I'm gonna click the drop down just to show you the different options. You can either turn it off for any one of these by keeping it at not used. You can offer the list selection, but still allow the individual to manually type in um, values as well. Or you can require the list selection. So um, this might, of course, remind you of you know, predefined lists where you can either require the predefined list be selected from, or users have the option as well as putting in their own values. So just depending on how you want to handle it per project in your environment. For us though, we are going to select for searching. We want to do require list selection. For adding and scanning, we're going to do offer list selection. And then for altering index values, I'm just gonna leave it at not used so we get a chance to see all the different options there. Now that we have that configured, we actually have to input the data that we want those um, drop downs to populate. So top left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see there is a fields tab that we're currently on and a data tab. So we're gonna click on data. And here we're going to go ahead and just manually enter a few, and then I'm gonna show you how it works with an imported list as well. So first I'm just gonna click add. The state we're gonna be working with is Colorado. I'm sure most of you are super surprised. I'm gonna make sure Colorado is selected and add my first city. We're gonna add Denver. I'm going to make sure Denver is selected and add some zip codes here. So click add and you'll notice in the add new child window at the top it says enter the name of the new child in parentheses zip to create under Denver. So depending on what is selected when you click add it'll tell you at the top what um, you, you're putting it under. So um, this we're putting it under Denver and it's going to be a zip code. So sometimes, of course, it's very common to accidentally click the wrong thing, or let's say we wanted to add another state, but Denver was still selected. Um, this kind of tells us that 
it's expecting a zip code here. We're going to put our first zip code in and click OK. Now I'm going to keep the zip code selected and click Add to kind of show you what happens. It lets us know that that field zip does not have any child relationships defined. So because in the field section it ends with zip, nothing can come after that. So I'm going to select Denver and add another zip code. And now I want to add another city. So in order to add another city, I have to select a state. I'm going to select Colorado and add the next city. And then I'm going to add a zip code under there as well. And finally, I'm just going to add one more city for us to have a few options. And one more zip code. All right, I'm going to go ahead and click OK to just save those settings. And then we're going to add a few more to the list by using the import option. First, we're going to see how it looks, and then we can compare and contrast after we import some more values. So we are going to go ahead and log into the website. I am not going to really add any security access, so we're going to want to log into the website as an administrator. So I'm going to log out of the MFA user, log back in as an admin. And I have that parent child project here. Just remember, we specify different functions with the parent child index fields for searching, uploading, and also altering index field values. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to upload since we don't have any documents in this project quite yet. So I'm going to hover over the icon there and select the upload button. When it comes to upload, I'm just going to pop open those settings in case anyone's kind of curious and wants a visual. Um, here for the adding and scanning, we have offer list selection selected. So it should offer us the drop downs, but we should be able to manually input as well. So here I'm going to select a state. If I click the drop down, I should see a state listed. I'm going to select Colorado. Using the city drop down, I have the three cities that I have configured. I'm going to go ahead and select Denver. And I should see the two zip codes underneath the Denver that I inputted when we configured it. So just to test the functionality, I'm going to add in a new one that is not in the list and see if it lets us still upload the document. I'm going to use the Select File button just to grab a sample document here and click Save. All right, it was uploaded successfully since we uh, could, it did allow us to pick from the list or add a new value. Now we're going to search for documents. As you remember, if I pull up the admin console, searching, the enforcement is set to require list selection. So I shouldn't be able to search by the zip code that I manually entered. It should only allow me the drop downs. We're going to hover over parent child and click the searching icon. Here you'll notice it looks a little bit different. Uh, the city and state are grayed out and I am unable to put my cursor into the state to type anything out. I can only select from the list. I'll choose Colorado. Same with city, I can't type anything in. We'll go to Denver. And then under zip code, you'll see the two zip codes that we configured previously, but we cannot add any extra zip codes in here. So this is a great option if you want to ensure 
all of your index fields are from a specific predefined list to kind of cut down on manual entry errors. Um, this is a, a great way to do that. You can force users to select from that list instead of manually entering something in there. We're going to go ahead and search even though we don't have any documents that have all of those index fields and we see that no records are available. So with the settings the way they are, we can't search for the document we just uploaded. Now I'm going to change some of these. I'm going to go ahead and log out as admin while I change some settings around. I am going to change searching to not used. And then altering index fields, I'm going to leave as not used so you can see that as well. And click OK. I'm going to log back in as that admin account and we're going to try to search on the parent child option. So now you'll notice there are no drop downs. However, the last thing we had entered is pulling up here. I'm just going to clear criteria and click search. And there is the document we previously uploaded. Now, if I wanted to alter the index values, I'm just going to make sure it's selected and click that edit button in my top toolbar. Here, you'll notice that I have to manually enter everything here since it's not being used for altering index field values. However, if we did set it to offer list or require list, you would have those drop down options here as well. All right, now we're going to go ahead and log out and add in an imported list of more cities and zip codes. I have a text document ready to import. Obviously, uh, no, no, normally you would probably have a lot of values. We're just having a couple just to demonstrate. I have two new cities and two new zip codes listed for each, or one zip code listed for each city. However, if I wanted to add another zip code for Bailey, I would just add a new line and change the zip code there. Now you can have um, a text file um, and it can be tab delimited or pipe delimited. You can use Excel, Let's say you have an Excel spreadsheet with a ton of values, you can just export that out as a tab delimited file and import it into Paper Vision Enterprise. That makes it really handy instead of having to configure everything by hand, you'll notice that even us doing it just for a couple values, it can take a bit of time. We're going to go back to our project, parent child, and go to define index field relationships by right clicking. Here we're going to go to our data tab and use that import button to import that text file. All you have to do is find where the file is located and select it. Then as long as your text file has the proper information and is delimited to where Paper Vision Enterprise can read it and pull it in, it will add your information. So we added uh, Estes Park and Bailey. You'll notice the added zip codes as well. If that text file had 60 more zip codes for uh, between Denver, Greenwood Village, and Littleton, it would add those under those as well. It would not duplicate any type of city, state, or zip code. So if something is already there, it just skips it and moves on. It doesn't have duplicate values. All right, we're going to go ahead and click OK. You'll also notice here you can remove certain fields yourself or you can clear and start over at any time. I'm actually going to go back into the index fields and turn everything on to offer list selection. And we're going to log in with that admin user one more time. and go to upload a new document. Here I'm going to choose Colorado and make sure my two new cities are populated in the city list. 
So as you can see now, I have five options. Bailey and Estes Park were added. If I select one of those, those zip codes are listed as well. I'm going to go ahead and upload a document. And we're going to go search for that document and edit some index fields so that you can see when the drop downs are available when you're altering index fields. So I'm just going to do a blank search. I'm going to go ahead and click that edit button to pull up our edit window. And here it shows me what they currently are. Notice that I can click in here and manually enter in uh, anything I'd like, or I can use the drop down to switch it to a different city, state, or zip. And that's been updated. All right, I'm going to go ahead and log out, and we'll go ahead and move on to the next section. The next thing we are going to demonstrate and go over are solution profiles. So solution profiles, um, a solution profile is a compressed folder containing specific information and data from selected projects and you select those projects when you're creating it. Um, also includes workflows, e-forms if those are selected and available, any groups and users that you select for those projects, and it allows you to, uh, you can use it to create or restore to any other entity. This allows us to create best of breed solutions and deliver those solutions to an end user or allow an end user to transfer their environment settings from one location to another without having to copy uh, the underlying database. So solution profiles can be used for creating, you know, ready to deploy templates. Um, it is important to know that this is um, just uh, transferring over the um, project configurations. It does not house any type of data groups or data group files. Solution profiles can be generated from the admin console. As you can see in the screenshot below, you would just right click the entity that contains the project or projects you would like to create a solution profile for and select generate solution profile. And we're going to go ahead and practice generating one and restoring one here in a bit. Once you select that generate solution profile, you will get a screen like below in the screenshot where you can specify a solution profile name. You can password protect the solution profile if you would like. If you leave it blank, it would just not ask for a password when it's being restored. And then you'll notice that you can pick and choose between all of your entity information um, specific to the projects. So here you'll notice in the projects list, you can select one or more projects to include in your solution profile. You can select uh, one or more user groups. Any workflow definitions that are available in any of those projects, you can select that as well, as well as eForm definitions. In the top right hand corner, you can put a, a brief or detailed description of what is within the solution profile if you would like as well. In the general section under the solution profile password, you'll notice you can choose to or to not include document security levels, document associations, and any active records retention policy sets for those selected projects. Once you have any type of user group selected, you'll notice that the include users in the selected groups is also an option. And any items selected in this list are writing into a series of files that are then zipped up. The zip file is then handed off for restoring into another system. When it comes to restoring a solution profile, you go about it much the same way you would be right clicking on the entity you'd like to restore it to and you'll pick the last option there restore from solution profile 
Once you do select that restore from solution profile, you'll get an image like below where you have the option to select the solution profile zip folder that you have on your machine. And if it does require a password, you'll be prompted for the password once you select it. As long as your password is correct, or if there is no password um, required, you will then be able to select what items you would like to restore from the solution profile. So um, if you decided you wanted to restore everything except you didn't, you wanted to create your own groups and users, you can uncheck anything from this list and it won't carry over. A couple of things I just want to mention uh, before we test it out. If a group or you, if a, sorry, if a user already exists in your entity, though does not make duplicates. So those are ignored. And I'll have an example of that here when we're setting up the restoration of a solution profile. So we're going to go ahead and get started on testing that. First, we want to create a solution profile. So I'm just going to go up to my entity. I'm going to right click and select generate solution profile. Here, the solution profile name, I'm going to name this one HR project. And I'm going to go ahead and give it a solution profile password. I'm just going to enter in test, all lowercase, but you can have it as complex as you'd like. Notice that all of my options below that are grayed out in the general section. That's just because we haven't selected any projects. So of course, with no projects selected, you can't include uh, specific configurations for those projects. So we're going to go ahead and select the project we'd like to do. I'm just going to do HR application. And you'll notice those were populated in the top left. So I could include all or any of those if they are available. I currently don't have any document security levels, associations, or records retentions for this project, so I'm going to leave those unchecked. And you will notice that the include users in selected groups is still grayed out. It'll remain grayed out until we select user groups from the bottom left-hand corner to add. So for this, I'm going to go ahead and add a user group. I'm going to add HR and restore. You'll notice that the include users in selected groups was uh, not is not grayed out anymore. So I'm going to select it. That means any users that are in these user groups will be packaged into the zip file. On the right hand side, you'll notice that there are some workflow definitions I have for these projects and one e-form definition that goes along with my HR employment application project. So um, you'll also notice that on the right hand side, all of your workflow definitions and all of your e-forms are populated and can be um, added to a solution profile, even if you are not selecting the project that they are associated with. So just to give you guys a little bit of background, this coding workflow definition is not part of the HR employment application. It's not assigned to it. However, um, I could still include it here. I do want to include the applicant review process because that is part of this project. And I want everyone to notice um, in the user group section in the bottom left, just keep an eye on that as I select my applicant review process. I selected applicant review process and a few of the user groups were automatically checked. This is because in my workflow definition, I do have those user groups assigned to certain work steps in the workflow. So when you're generating a solution profile, it tries to help you out as much as possible. It assumes if you want to take this workflow definition, you probably want the user groups that are assigned to those work steps within the definition. Most of the time, yeah, that would probably be the situation. So we're going to leave it as is. Same thing with eForm definitions. If you're using any type of user groups for permissions in eForm definition, they'll automatically be checked on the right 
as you check the eForm definition. So again, if you want to keep your eye on that user groups section, I'm going to click on new hire application for the eForm definition option. And two more groups were checked automatically on the left hand side. So let's say I didn't want one of those user groups. I'm going to uncheck applicants, which automatically got checked when I cho chose my eForm definition. You get this helpful little prompt. It says deselecting this group, which is applicants, will also deselect the dependent eForm new hire applications. Do you want to continue or not? If I say yes, you'll notice my eForm definition was unchecked as well. If I try it again and hit no, it'll leave it checked. I'm going to uncheck the workflow or department managers, which is a group that I do use in the um, eForm. If I say yes, you'll notice the eForm was uh, unchecked, the same as applicants. So we're going to try doing one of these other groups that are only part of the workflow definition, such as sales managers. Deselecting group sales managers will also deselect the dependent workflow application review process. So if you click yes, it unchecks your workflow definition. So just be mindful, it wants to bring the user groups that are associated with the workflow definition and eForm definitions because of course they are specified within the definition and you need them in order to process it. So we're going to go ahead and leave it as is. Those user groups are coming over. The include users in selected groups in the top left is checked. That means any users that are a part of those groups will automatically get applied as well. However, when we restore this into another entity, if some of those user names are already assigned in the admin console, it will not override that information. It will just not import that specific user. And we'll get into that once we're restoring. Here, this configuration is the way I want it. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Save. And it asks you where you want to store this zipped file containing your solution profile. It automatically dates it for you. It has the solution profile name followed by solution profile and the date and time. I'm just going to put it on my desktop and click save. Gives you a little prompt that says the new solution profile was written to and then it uh, shows you the path wherever you chose to save it. And if everyone can see, I know it might be a little bit small depending on the top on the left hand side of my screen, I have this compressed zip folder. And that contains my solution profile. All right, now we are going to restore a solution profile and see how that works. So I'm going to pull back up the admin console. Close out of here. Notice that all of my configurations are the same here. Um, generating a solution profile does not change anything in your entity. It does not remove users and groups that you are um, making a solution profile of. Um, all that stays the same. So now we're going to restore a solution profile that I have from a previous entity. So um, first I'm just gonna kind of browse out to that location so you guys can see it. Here is a restore project solution profile that I made previously before the training, and we're going to see if we can restore that to our entity. Top left hand corner, we're going to right click the entity we want to restore it to. And select restore from solution profile. Here I have to put in where the file location is, so I'm going to use that ellipsis to the right. And you'll see it went right to it, um, probably because that location is cached, but it makes it easy for me. I'm just going to select it and click open. And it's asking me for the password. So when I previously created this restore project solution, um, I gave it the password test, all lowercase, so I'm going to put that in. And if your password was incorrect, I'm just going to put in something else. 
and click OK. It'll tell you the supplied password is incorrect. And it'll keep doing that until you put in the correct password. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the correct password and click OK. It gives me the solution profile name as well as a list of items that I can or uh, if I didn't want to restore, I can uncheck them. Here it'll, it says I am restoring one workflow definition, one project, security access rights for that project, two groups, and three users. So you'll notice that it says restore missing users, but it just says restore groups. So this is kind of where it differs when it comes to solution profiles when restoring. It does go ahead and pull, it pulls in all of the groups that are in the solution profile, even if there are groups that are named that already in existence. However, it puts a parenthesis and then two, um, just so you, two or three, depending on how many copies you already have. So it does differentiate between the two. However, it does go ahead and pull them in in case you um, did want to work with those groups. However, when it comes to users, you can imagine um, how it wouldn't want to overwrite any data with users, and instead of having duplicates with users, um, it only restores the ones not currently in the admin console for this entity. So we're going to click Start and see what happens. It lets us know that it was completed successfully. The following items were created, one workflow definition, one project, one project security access right, two groups, and only two users. If you'll notice right below this window, it does say um, restore missing users, and then it gives us three. So there were three users that were backed up with this solution profile. However, one already exists in our system, so only two of them are being pulled in. And I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. And we're gonna see what was added. So if I go to projects, you'll notice under the last project I created, there is a new one that says project restore. If I expand that, and go to security access. The security access for that project was also carried over. I have a group called restore with two people in it. I also have a workflow definition. And then in system groups, you'll notice I already had a group called restore. So the one that was just pulled in is now called restore two. At this point, I can change the name of this one uh, to be more specific to this specific project or I could delete the old one if I don't need it. Um, just to kind of show you this restore, you'll notice the group members are Bob and Chris. This is something that I set up previously within this entity. This restore that came through with that solution profile has Kevin and Pete as group members instead. So they are different. However, they share the same group name, so that is why it does go ahead and add it, but puts those parentheses around it. This, however, is important to remember for if you are using a workflow definition, such as the one here, if I open up my restore workflow, I have a manual um, work step, and you'll see that uh, it automatically updates the work step participant to reflect that parenthesis two. This is pretty cool. I, it's something that I feel is very helpful um, so that you don't have to be super mindful of going back in here and making sure you update this uh, just to you know, compensate for that group already existing because you definitely don't want, uh, let's say it didn't do this and it just said restore. That, of course, would mean that the users in the current group restore would have access to this work step, even though um, they didn't when it was created into a solution profile. So if you do rename anything in groups after a solution profile, for example, if we went to system groups and we deleted this and created a new one, 
you would definitely want to go to workflow definitions and change it there, of course. But um, as it pulls in, it does update this information. And you'll see that though there is a restore option, it keeps the restore in parentheses too in your definition. So nothing really has to be configured there after you import it. If I go into system users, you see we do have a few extra. It's hard to remember without a screenshot of exactly what we had, but I will say that the test user was created in the solution profile previously when I created it for the demonstration. And Pete and Kevin were also part of that. So those were the three that were in the solution profile. However, Kevin and Pete were added, but the test account remains the same as when I first created it um, before the demonstration today. So one more thing to remember when you're pulling in a solution profile, if let's say um, Kevin was a user from that solution, solution profile and we had left his password blank or given him a specific password in the last entity, passwords are not carried over. So when you do import users using solution profiles, you will have to come into the admin console and set the password to whatever you'd like. All right. Again, if anyone has questions, I know a lot goes into solution profiles and there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. Um, you could definitely use it as just template type of thing. Um, in between locations or different entities, um, but it's pretty cool functionality and definitely helps. Um, just a couple things to remember uh, when using workflow definitions and e-form definitions, you do have to pull in those groups that are assigned within those definitions. And any type of system users that you pull in, the passwords do not come with them. And there will not be any duplicate system users. However, system groups do pull in regardless of what is currently in the admin console, but you can differentiate because it does add that parentheses two or three, uh, depending on what you already have. All right, we're gonna keep moving on. And the next thing we're gonna talk about is some improved logging options that we now have. It is now possible to automatically clean up import and maintenance log entries. This functionality has been added to the data tab within system settings, and that's under global administration, in the uh, ad administration console. At the bottom of this section, there is now a system log archiving slash cleanup section. Here, you are able to set retention times for both the import log entries as well as the maintenance log entries. This is measured in hours. And once these log entries reach the set time, you can choose to either archive those logs by selecting the archive system logs option on the left, or you can choose to delete them by selecting the cleanup system logs option on the right. As import logs are archived, uh, database records are removed and placed in a textual XML document. Um, you cannot search these textual XML documents from PaperVision Enterprise itself, like through the admin console, but you can access that data using a separate application. And we're just going to kind of explore that a bit. I'm going to go to global administration in the top left hand corner and select system settings. Here on the right hand side, I'm going to click on configure system settings. Move to the data tab. And at the very bottom of this screen, you'll see that there is that system log archiving and cleanup. Right now it's set to default which is 36 hours for both and archive system logs. To change this, you would just select in here, 
change the hour amount, keep it on archive system logs or clean up system logs. I'm just going to leave everything the same. Uh, like I said before, we're not going to be here for another hour to kind of see this in the works, um, but this is where you would set that up. And I'm just going to go up to the top left hand corner and go to import logs. Just to kind of see how it would work, I'm going to manually uh, submit some of these to be archived. Oops, sorry, one second. Sorry, I <laughs> had a little moment of lapse. Uh, to archive logs, you do have to right click the import log section instead of the specific logs themselves over on the left hand side. And if you right click on import logs, you can archive old import logs. So for that, I am going to go ahead and archive. And this will check that value that you have in system settings. For me, I just left it at 36 hours. And all of these are from 426, so it's definitely been 36 hours. So it's going to um, take all of the import logs older than that. And I'm going to click say yes. The import log entries have been archived. So as you can see, I no longer have them in import logs. If I right click on import logs and go to the import log, log archives, I do have that. Uh, XML data here. So you'll notice that, that you don't have the option to restore. So just keep that in mind if you are wanting to archive logs, um, there is not a way to restore them back into your import logs list. However, you can view them at any time. This is also information available in the in an archiving uh, table within the database as well. I'm just going to select this one and click view. And this, of course, uh, automatically opens up just with a browser. Um, if you had a different application where you can view XML data a little bit better, um, you could definitely make that just whatever default application would open an XML file. And it gives me the information from those logs here. So just when you archive them, it, you can definitely go back and look at data. You just kind of see it in a different way and it gets added to an XML. So all of the logs from that specific time frame will go into one XML document and you can view it that way. Again, if in system settings, you had changed this to clean up system logs, then it would just delete them. For archiving uh, the import logs, you do want to um, ensure that you have the, if you want it to go through and go automatically every 36 hours or anything that's older than 36 hours, you will want report archiving automation service running. All right. Again, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask them at the end or throw them in that ch chat box. The last thing we're going to be talking about today is the mobile application. So um, if anyone has not seen or heard of our mobile applications, we do have mobile applications available for paper vision and image silo, both for iOS and Android. Um, at the moment, if you have the Paper Vision application, by default, it does bring you up to papervision.com. However, if you wanted to use a different Paper Vision Enterprise instance, um, you can update that URL in the system settings, and that is for iOS. 
when it comes to Android, that feature um, to be able to edit that URL is uh, coming soon. But I know that's something that's fairly new. And um, if anyone has used that paper vision application, you can update that URL if you're using iOS instead of finding that information in the paper vision application itself, you do go to your phone's system settings, go down to the application name, and then change the URL there. Since I can't um, bring up that my mobile device on the screen, um, we are just gonna kind of look at some screenshots to show you how the application looks. And to do that, I'm going to pull up um, a project that we have, and I'm going to try to make it as big as possible. Okay, hope everyone can see this all right. I'm gonna get this a little bit bigger and we're gonna go through this together. And feel free if you guys have uh, your mobile phones with you, um, you should be able to search in your app store if you want to test out the paper vision or the image silo, you would just type that in and you should see that listed in the app, app store. Once you have it downloaded and installed, you would open it. And this is what you would be met with. Of course, this might look a little different depending on your device and how large your screen is and the orientation. On the left-hand side, it's papervision.com example. On the right-hand side, it's image silos. So as you can see, they are um, pretty identical, but it does tell you in the top left which you are logging into. You have the option to enter your entity ID your username, password, and then you'll see that you have that use multi-factor authentication link above the login button in case MFA is required for your account. If it is, you would have to do this um, through the mobile application as well. You can also use the forgot your password link here. Once you're logged in, it'll look like the screenshot in the top left you'll notice that there is a project section. Underneath that are the recent documents. Here, of course, your project list might be a lot longer. This was just an example. On the right-hand side, this is the screen you'd see after selecting one of the projects. In this example, I selected the Accounts Payable Workflow Project. Make this a little bit bigger. And here you can search on any type of index fields. Here I'm searching for a asterisk, which just means anything that has a company name that starts with A. Once hitting that search button at the bottom, it gives you a list of documents. So on the left-hand side of the screen that we're showing now, you'll see that this is showing the list of documents. On the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that it says one through 90 of 90 documents. And for each document, it shows all of the index field values of how you would really see it on a browser on a computer. So um, if you remember when viewing it on a machine or on a computer, you do see all of the index field values for that document in a line. This does the same thing, it just has them vertically since that's the way it can fit them. So here you'll notice that that is a document on the left. The company name is Allen's API Services, gives all the other index field value of that document. And you would open it by just double tapping it. And then on the right hand side, this is what it would look like right when you open the document. It shows the image of the document in the bottom section, you'll notice that you have a toolbar. And this is, of course, um, very similar, if not the same, as options in the browser-based viewer. It's just very condensed. 
Next, we'll go over how to edit values of an, a document currently being pulled up. So we have this document that we opened. At the very bottom, if you select the menu icon, you get this pop-up to the right that pulls over and you have two tabs at the top. The first one is home, the second one is edit. And by default, right when you click that menu button, it always um, refers, go, pulls up the edit tab first, but you can click home. And you'll see a little later that the home tab has all of your navigation type uh, settings that you would see in your browser-based viewer. On the edit tab, however, You'll notice in the top left-hand corner, you have the ability to check out a document from your mobile device. You can undo a checkout and you can check a document back in. You can see the history of that document. You can edit the index field values. You can email the document if that's allowed by your system admin. You can duplicate the document. You can even create a document share you can see the document's info as well as full text information if the document has any. Underneath that, you can view uh, annotations and textual notes. You cannot create um, annotations, of course, just like you can't on the browser-based viewer on a computer. You can use this document to create a new workflow instance or see the status of the uh, work, workflow instance status if it already is one. You can show or hide signatures and you can also sign the document. On the right hand side, this just kind of shows you what happens if you were to click the edit button. And this is just editing those index field values for this document. So you can go in here, update anything if you would need to, and then click the update button. And it would work the same way you would in a browser. You can also add textual notes. Here is an example of that. It shows you all of the previous textual notes as well. And then anything you put in the top section is what's going to be added. And then you would just click that add button. You can also use the mobile application to update your password. To do that, you would select the top right hand menu button and you would see what is usually on the top of the browser on a computer. So you have your global search option. You can change this to quick search. You have your user dropdown with your normal user dropdown options there, such as viewing your application tokens, your user options. Here you can um, turn off MFA if that's something that you needed to do. And of course, you have the change password option. And then on the right hand side, this just shows you what it looks like when you're changing your password. You put in your current and then put in the new password and confirm and click change. And this is um, screenshots I'm showing now are um, specific to iOS, but the same functions are available in Android as well. However, the only difference is um, in order to change the URL, you would go to your system settings on an iOS device and change it there. And then that functionality is coming soon for Android as well. All right, we have gone through our agenda for today. Thank you all again for listening in. Um, we would love to uh, answer any type of questions if you guys have them at this time. And then um, if any of you kind of came in late and didn't hear, this is being recorded in, um, and it's gonna be available on my DSI in a week or so. All right, so yeah, if everyone sees that chat box, um, go ahead and put any questions 
in it and we can definitely take a look at that. Otherwise, if you don't have any questions, again, thank you so much for attending. Um, and yeah, this will be available if you did want to go back and see some of the demonstrations later. Thank you, Wendy. We really appreciate uh, the hard work and the really good demonstration of the software. Um, everybody, feel free to go ahead and uh, chime in with your questions, and the three of us will try to field them as best as possible.